And happy Resurrection Sunday to you all. Hallelujah. My sister is, um, she's uh, lying up at St. Francis right now, but you know what? This may be her home-going day. What a day to go home. Resurrection Sunday. Because he rose again, we too have that hope and, and that confidence that we can be resurrected too. Amen? Kids, you may be dismissed and go to class. We've got uh, teachers are back there. They'll help guide and direct your way. If not, talk to Curtis. He knows where to go. <clears throat> Rod and Beth, good to have you guys here. Rod, come on up and just take your liberty in the Lord. He, he said he just really keeps texting me with these. He says, I've got a powerful message, Pastor. I said, well, come share it, Rod, because we need it. Amen? So welcome, Rod, right now to our congregation. Been around for a long time, brother. Amen. How's everybody doing? One person's doing good. <clears throat> it's a blessing to be with you this morning. I mean it. It's what an honor to be with you and to be with you on Sunday. I, I think, I don't know the last time I've been here on Resurrection Sunday. It's been quite a long, long time, maybe a few decades. I tell you, <clears throat> the power of the resurrection still touches me today and I am I'm just so thankful that God did not just forgive me but he washed my sin away you know that's more than a song line it means that the blood of Jesus has the power to remove sin as if it had never been there See the difference? It's not just forgiveness. It's the removal of sin. And sometimes I think, you know, we sing the songs and, and our hearts are very thankful, but sometimes we don't even realize the power we carry inside of us. And this is what I love. His blood not only washes away the sins that I have committed, but it also washes away the sins that others have committed against me. Many of us have been harmed. We've been injured. We've been wounded by sometimes the people we love most. Those hurt worse than strangers, don't they? I mean, you think about it. And yet the blood of Jesus has the power to remove, and, to remove that sin and to heal that wound. And I just, I tell you, I want to just share that this morning. I feel led to say it because all of us need healing. And I, the Jesus' blood is more than a line in a song and a line in a message. It is the most powerful agent in all the universe. I pray that Jesus' blood this morning will wash away that sin for us, but also bring that healing that every one of us need. And you know, there's an old saying, wounded people wound people. And so when we're wounded by others, we get scars and we tend to wound others. And the blood of Jesus, the resurrection power of Jesus' blood is to remove that sin, but also to heal those wounds. Whenever Jesus showed up on the third day, the amazing thing was he had his wounds in his glorified body, but they weren't bleeding. They were healed. And many of us, all of us, carry wounds. Have you ever, we were just eating at a restaurant here in town. That I worked at that restaurant when it was a store, when I was 14, cut the, cut the end of my thumb off on the meat slicing machine. And we walked in there and I told my mom, I said, look at that, I said, there's still my blood down on the floor. Just kidding. It wasn't there. But you know, I still have that wound. You could still see where the end of my thumb was cut off. And you know, that thing hurt for about 15 years. About 15 years it hurt. And then gradually the pain went away. The blood of Jesus has the power to heal. Not just remove sin, but to heal. Lord, we thank you 
for this resurrection morning. And although it's raining, it's sunshine in the kingdom of God. And Lord, today we pray that you will help us to receive what you have to say, not what I have to say, but what you have to say. Lord, not only what you have to say, but what you have to do in each of our hearts. We pray, touch us as you desire, because everything you touch is transformed. And there are things in our lives that need transformation. There are caterpillars in our lives that need to be turned into butterflies. There are areas of our life that still crawl the earth when you have called them to fly and to be released in the beauty of transformation. And we ask you, do that here this morning. We open our heart to, to you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, there are many things God will do if we open our hearts, but he won't force it open. So I pray that our hearts are open this morning. Acts 2.24 I'm going to read that here in a moment if you guys want to put that up on the board. I usually give an update on our ministry, but I just feel led to, to press right in today. The scripture says, it's, in this passage it actually says, whom God raised up. I'm going to say God raised up because he's talking about Jesus. Jesus having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. So it was not possible for Jesus to be held by death. We can agree with that, right? This resurrection power was in him. It didn't appear in him the day he died or three days later. This resurrection power of God was inside of Jesus from the very beginning. And this is our cornerstone passage today. It was not possible for Jesus to be held by death. Neither shall it be possible that we will be held by death. Now stick with me. I know you already know this. Some may not think this is relevant until they die. But it's very relevant to your life and to my life right now. In fact, it's more relevant to our lives right now probably than ever before. And, and I'll tell you where I'm going with this. If you guys would put Romans 8, 6 up. Paul said, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So we understand that death is not just something that happens at the end of our physical life on earth. Death is working in the world right now. Death is working in the carnal mindedness of the world. Are you tracking with me? But life is working in those who are spiritually minded, are moving, if you will, in the things of the Spirit of God. Jesus said in John 17, 3, this is eternal life. Watch this. This is really fascinating that they may know you. So suddenly Jesus gives us a glimpse of this opening in relationship, not church membership, not what we think in our heads necessarily, but this relationship, when we have relationship with God, this life of God is being pumped into us every moment of our lives. This life, this eternal life resides in us. One of my favorite scriptures was when Jesus replied to Martha, and I'm going to read uh, John 11:25. I love this passage. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives, believes in me, and believes in me, shall never die. Now this is interesting. First he says, they will die, but they shall live. Then he says, they shall never die. There's a lot there. I love this. He says, do you believe this? This morning, do you believe this? So as we walk in genuine relationship with God, please hear me. I'm not saying we go to church. Now, I, go to church is very important. That's a key part of walking in relationship with God. But it's not enough. I have talked to many people who said, Rod, I went to church for years, 
and realized my relationship with God was like this. The, the size of my walk with God was like this. And so because of that, there was very little being deposited into their lives because they were checking a block. They weren't walking in a relationship. Have you ever seen a marriage or perhaps been in a marriage where they're just checking the blocks? There's a difference between being in love and checking blocks. Are you tracking with me? The cells of our bodies look the same under the microscope, but they're not the same as those who do not carry eternal life. The DNA that is inside of you when you carry this resurrection power has within it eternal life if you're in relationship with God that DNA will be risen from the dead. It has that life in it right now. So much so that Jesus gives us two scenarios that are both true. He says, if you die, you will live, but understand, you won't die. Right? You're just going to change addresses. But this life is working in us right now. If we know God, genuinely know God, this is important. Remember back in the Romans 8 scripture, when Paul talks about the carnally minded is death and the, and the spiritually minded is life. So as we walk in this relationship, this resurrection power is inside of your relationships. It's in, sometimes you may look out and go, man, have you ever done this? Like you're looking out and someone's making a really terrible decision and then another terrible decision, another terrible decision. You're like, man, wh what's going on? A lot of times they're not in the counsel of God. Are you tracking? So if they do not live in that relationship counsel with God, there's a minimal amount of grace being deposited, not because it's not available, but because they're not receiving it. This is resurrection power that will be manifested in every relationship in our lives. It will be manifested in the way we live. It will be manifested in how happy we are. I hear a lot of preachers say, well, you know, God didn't promise you to be happy. You know, joy is different. Well, the, de the technical definition uh, in, in the original language of joy is extreme divine happiness. There's a supernatural happiness that comes not from this world, but from the heavens. And this life, this resurrection life of Jesus is operating in us. The more we press into this relationship and invest into this relationship, this resurrection power is being carried within us. And literally what the scripture says of Jesus is true of us in Acts 2 that we read, because it was not possible that he should be held down by death. So it, when you're living in this, death cannot hold you down. Not just the, the death at the end of your life, but the death Paul talked about in Romans chapter 8. How many of you have ever experienced death in a relationship? How many of you have ever experienced death in your finances or in a business decision or in a major life decision? I think we all have. But whenever we are walking in this life of God, resurrection power of Jesus is operating so that that death cannot hold you down. Are you guys with me? Now, we need this word right now because right now darkness is coming upon the earth in a way that we have not seen in our lifetime. And I want to say something to you. You have nothing to worry about if you operate in this resurrection power. What's the worst thing they can do to me? Kill us, right? I've been close to death many times. I've lived a soldier's life. I mean, they told me cancer was going to take my life in two years. You, you guys know that was seven years ago. Amen. Somebody say hallelujah. <laughs> At least the people who love me. Many times. But I'm going to tell you the resurrection life of Jesus, it does something to you. It messes you up. 
It changes you. And what I mean by mess you up is you're not like everybody else. Because the death in that in, the, in all of those things, whether it's relationships, life, decisions, finances, whatever it is, this resurrection power of Jesus is operating. And I want to tell you, it's supernatural. You know that, but it's supernatural. It'll make you do things that are not possible. <laughs> Someone said to me, we, I tell you, we've had so many miracles, guys. I mean, I'd love to just come back and talk about miracles, <laughs> but... Uh, there, man, I'm going to get off track here. I just, there's, I was, we were just in Denver last week with a, a fellowship. We're, we're tending the fires of revival. And I want to tell you, they're all over the earth. There are revivals all over the earth. Now, right now, they're little fires, but they're going to be big fires. There's an enormous revival that's coming to the whole earth. Now, I don't mean every single person is going to get saved. You know that. The Scripture says there's going to be a great falling away, but there's also going to be enormous revival, and much of that revival will come from the people who tend the fires of that revival. So if you can picture with me these bonfires in different places in the earth, and these fires will grow because that's what the kingdom of God does. And there's a precious woman in this fellowship and uh, she asked for prayer. She was in our home in 2018. We were having a, a, a gathering. And she asked for prayer because she's blind. Now, she wasn't totally blind, but she was blind. And she asked for prayer, and God healed her. And she had asked for prayer for her father and her brothers because they're not believers. And her father, I think, was in his late 70s. And she said, please, this, she just recently asked us in January to pray for her father and her brothers. And so we did. I said, where do they live? And she told us they live on the big island in Hawaii. And I said, oh, okay. Well, in December, I'm, I'm sorry, the month prior to this prayer for her father and her brothers, another friend had visited this family. And they told me, they said, I visited the family. And she said, you know, I think God's doing something. So I talked to one of the pastors. I said, listen, I, I think there's something stirring in the spirit. You, you, I think you should go. I think you should go down there and throw a log on this fire and see what happens. He goes, yeah, I can do that. He took 22 people with him, and they flew to Hawaii on the big island. Now, I know, you know, when you go on a mission trip to Hawaii, you get 22 people. You know, I mean, <laughs> if I had a show of hands right now, uh, you know, who go to Africa, I'd probably get two. You know, go to Hawaii, I probably, everybody in here probably raise their hand. So she goes, they go back down there. He, they go down there, and God does several miraculous miracles, and her father gives his life to the Lord. His brothers tried to stop him. Her brothers tried to stop him from giving his life to the Lord. And then God did another miracle, and then one of the brothers goes, oh, man, I got it. And he just gives his life to the Lord, gets baptized also right there, and this just keeps happening. So what I'm saying is that there's revival fires going everywhere. This resurrection powers in us, and we're carrying it. And God says, listen, there might be darkness on the earth, but there won't be darkness at your campsite if you've got the fire going, right? I want to say for our families, it's very important that we build these fires in our families. Guys, listen, you can do this. You don't have to make fire. God made it. All you have to do is just throw logs on it and keep it fueled. You see what I'm saying? And then this resurrection power moving, listen, it will manifest in wisdom. Now, you know, some of us aren't the brightest in the world. There's a lot of people I've met that are a lot brighter than I am, that are a lot smarter than I am. But I'll tell you this. When you walk in this close communion with God and with His people, you will start to make some of the wisest decisions of your life because of God's direction. His resurrection power will be moving. And just don't start thinking it's your IQ and, and you'll be okay. You keep making good decisions and profound things will happen in your life. Because this resurrection power will manifest in your life decisions, in your marriage, in your children, in how you raise your children, 
And you will see children who know God if you know God. Not if Pastor Jerry has a good program down at the church. You know, God didn't call the church workers to disciple your children. He called you to disciple your children. God called them to put the polish on it. Just think of it that way. It's my call to disciple my children. Now, my children are grown. Some of them are here, right out there. Great to see you guys. Thanks for coming. I paid them to come. No, I'm kidding you. <laughs> they brought, they brought they, uh, Tay and Nicole are troopers. Uh, they have four of our grandchildren and one in the womb. Can I announce that? So, yeah. Nicole is carrying grandchild number 18. Amen. And that's not including, we have six grandchildren in heaven. We have two children in heaven also, so it's getting kind of big up there too. You know, I'm, this is totally off the subject, but I was praying this week, Pastor, and, you know, sometimes I get glimpses. The closer you get to the other side, the more you feel it. I love growing old. I know you. some of you don't. I don't like the aches and pains, and some of you know I've got a lot of them, spending so many decades in the military. But I saw the fellow, I saw New Covenant Fellowship on the other side. And there's more in that fellowship than there are here. <laughs> and I was blessed to see the young people up here because generational transfer is our responsibility. It's our responsibility to, to help them walk with God and to know Him better than we do. I mean, I'm going to tell you, I made a lot of mistakes in my life. And some of you are my family. Some of you know my mistakes. Some of you know my mistakes intimately and, and, and are wounded by them. But I'll tell you this. This resurrection power has the power not only to heal, but to open our eyes to see the other side. And it's glorious. It's majestic. It's powerful. It's not enough to know it. It's not enough to know the resurrection. This is the hardest challenge for guys that do what I'm doing right now. This is the greatest challenge. Because if all we do is transfer knowledge from the pulpit, it doesn't work. You have to be able to see it. So it has to be not information, but revelation. In other words, there has to be an opening of the eyes. And I can't open your eyes. Only God can open your eyes. Only the Holy Spirit can open your eyes to see. And this is what I pray. Every time I serve you, every time I serve others, I pray, God, please, Holy Spirit, open eyes. And man, it's hard. It's hard. A good friend of mine told me, he said, you know, he was blinded in a motorcycle accident. And he goes, man, I'll tell you, it's scary when you get lost in your own home. We were helping grandmother the other day. She's blind. And, and I'll tell you, it's hard when you can't see. It, even if you know what it looks like or what it used to look like, it's so hard. It's not the same if you can't see. Lord, open our eyes and cause us to see. It's very important that we can see into the other side. It's also important that we can see where we are, the truth. Because there's darkness creeping upon the earth in many ways. And yet, even though this darkness does... This resurrection life is operating in us and God is calling us to live with these fires. And if you build these fires, if we build these fires in our homes and in our spiritual family and in our tribes, we will live in the light. What does it mean to live in the light? What am I saying? There's great darkness coming upon the earth. Have any of you figured that out yet? If you haven't, I'm not joking, if you have not figured this out yet, some of you guys that are younger, you will see what I'm saying. Many of us have a, a different frame of reference than you do because we have so many decades to compare and to see what's happening. You can, the longer you live, the more you can see trends. There are people today who are Christians who operate in darkness and they don't even know it's darkness. But they will know because it will mature.
Jesus said, in him was life. This is John 1, 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not comprehend it. I want to share with you, and th- we're not going to have time to cover all this today. So this is part one, and then maybe we can get a sequel in June or something, come back. But I want to share something. This is very important. God began to show me three things he was going to do in 2022 and beyond. Twenty, And not just that he was going to do, but things that are going to happen. Now, I shared this in January with our own spiritual family, and you can go hear the beginnings of this on our teaching library. By the way, teaching library is doing great. Our broadcast, we, got, we have listeners in 60, over 60 nations now, so it's really taken off. But I shared it there, but I'm going to share it with you. I believe that this year and the coming decade that we're in is a year of the magnifying glass and acceleration. And I'll explain this in a moment. I believe it's a year and a decade of oceans more. And I believe it's a year and a decade of of gathering our hearts. And I'll share just a little bit of this with you, but we won't have time to cover it all today. God is increasing the contrast between light and darkness. He's increasing the contrast now more than ever before, than I've ever seen in my lifetime anyway, between good and evil. The light will grow brighter and the darkness will grow darker. Don't put your head in the sand because you don't like the bad news. Live in the light. There are things happening on this earth I never thought I would see in my lifetime, but I believed would happen. I sent, Pastor Jerry, I sent you and I think Curtis, uh, uh, Lester Summerall shared seven things God showed him that was going to happen in America. And he shared them for the first time together, all seven of them in the mid-80s. And people had a hard time hearing it. How many of you know Lester Summerall? I mean, he's with the Lord. Yeah, we still got some folks that know. I mean, I consider him a spiritual father to me. I listened to probably hundreds of hours of his teaching, took some courses in his school, and he laid his hands on me. I mean, God, there was an impartation that God gave me from him, and I thank God for it. One of the main things was the spirit of victory. God imparted a spirit of victory upon my life from Lester Sumrall that I carry with me today. And now my children are living in that blessing also, and they're carrying that spirit of victory upon them. And he shared seven different things. People were having a hard time receiving it then. You can go find it on YouTube. It's all over YouTube. And when you watch it, you'll see why. God gave him these in the early 60s when he was in Manila. And so he came back, and he would share one at a time, one here, one there, And then the first time I think he ever shared all seven was in the mid-80s. Even today, people are going, well, now people are going, wow, this is scary. This is all happening. And there's still more to happen. And he spoke concerning the darkness that the enemy would bring against America. I'd like to read Matthew 13, 30. Let both the wheat and the tares grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers first, gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So there's this dynamic that's happening in the earth right now. The tares and the wheat are growing. Tares look like wheat. There are people who are tares. They think they're wheat. They think they're Christians, but they... They don't live a life of repentance and holiness. The scripture says without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Now guys, this is not work salvation. It's called fruit salvation. If you know God, repentance will operate in your life. I'm not saying you'll be perfect in one day, but I'm saying that repentance, the Bible is saying that repentance will work in us, like John the Baptist said, works that are worthy of repentance. This is not a popular message. This is part of the problem why we are in the shape we're in right now is because we need more churches teaching on holiness and repentance and and walking before the Lord and the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. So right now the church doesn't 
Some churches know it, but I believe the church in America right now is in a course correction. And the darkness will force the course correction because the only churches that will truly survive in the Spirit of God are churches who walk and live in the light. And so there are people who are tares and they think they're wheat. And there's also a few people that are wheat, they think they're tares because they're living under condemnation. But the Scripture teaches us without holiness, no one will see the Lord. So here we are. And the tares are growing up. And what does that mean? The wickedness is getting more wicked. Have you noticed in the news? You see things happening right now you did not think would happen, right? If you, if you look, I mean, I don't even want to repeat them in this setting because some of them are so horrible. There's the, but here's the, here's the good news is the wheat is also growing, right? The righteous are growing more righteous, if you're living in the light. They're walking more and more and more in the salvation and the resurrection power of the Lord in our lives. In other words, they're burning the bonfires. It's like, man, other people are living in darkness and the bonfires just burning in their lives and they're like, darkness? What darkness? You know? Well, you ever been at a campsite at night and you got a fire going? And you look over and there's no moon that night. There's lo the lunar luminosity is real low. And you look out in the woods and, man, it's dark out there. You know, I remember as a kid, we look out there and you hear one sound and you're like, ooh, you know, you were kind of afraid. You, it's dark. And it's thick darkness. Israel had this happen. Remember? Israel, one of the plagues was darkness. And the Bible says that it was, by, by the way, this has to be supernatural darkness. It says that the darkness was so great, correct me if I'm wrong, they couldn't see their hand in front of them. But it said, you go down into Goshen, where the Israelites lived, and there was light. They could see. The darkness is getting darker, and the light is getting lighter. There are people who are embracing darkness or elements of darkness from the church, and they don't know it. Be patient with them. They, th they believe things that are not true. There's some deadly teachings. There are demonic doctrines being released in the earth. They're supernaturally powered by the evil one. The Bible calls it doctrines of demons. That's what the scripture calls it. But they think it's good. Be patient. Because the darkness is going to get darker. And as it gets darker and the contrast gets greater, it will become more apparent. And then they will have a decision to make. They'll have to say, am I going to eat some humble pie and repent and say I was wrong, or am I going to keep on holding on to it? Have you ever been there? <laughs> you ever been wrong and you, find, you just figured it out and you're like, your pride won't let you let it go? <laughs> Okay, if no one here has been in that, then you, you got to learn to tell the truth, right? We've all been there. Hopefully less as we get older and get more mature. So in, 20, in 2022 and beyond, we're seeing something happen in the earth where they're calling good evil and evil good. All these things, I mean, like there's certain things that people are saying, well, this is good, and you need to enforce it. You're like, man, that's the Bible. God teaches us that's evil. But the peer pressure has lured us and seduced us, if you will. And I'm not saying us as necessarily in this room, but as a nation, we're being seduced into doctrines of demons that are not true. And they're saying, well, this is good. This is good. This is good. If you believe this, that's despicable. And it's actually what God says. This is happening on a major level. Which way are you going to go? Are you going to go the way God says in the Scripture? Because I'll tell you, if you walk with the darkness long enough, you'll become comfortable with the darkness. And it's very seductive because the world loves it. And then you feel like they love you and you feel like you're doing the right thing. What does God say? You all see where we're going with this this morning. The resurrection power of Jesus is the light of God that sheds light and goes, Rod, you're wrong about this. Many times the Lord has done that with me. Many times he said, Rod, uh, you're wrong. Look, 
This is what the scripture says. And I'm like, Lord, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I mean, please forgive me for believing it, but please forgive me for influencing people. These are do- this is a doctrine and demon. That's a seduction of the enemy. What does God say? And the church has pressed through 2,000 years and been through many generations. Listen, the church has been through some wicked generations. Go study the church of the 2nd, 3rd, 4th century. The paganism and unbelievable wickedness. And they did not have a problem imparting the faith to the next generation. Generational transfer. It's not the culture. Stop blaming the culture if you're not achieving generational transfer. Stop blaming the sin because God's power is greater than that, but we must disciple every generation. We have to, you can't just teach them to walk with God, you have to walk with God. Because we reproduce after like kind. You guys know as parents, kids don't do what you tell them. They do what you do. We have to cultivate the next generation to walk with God. Our own natural generation, I'm talking about our own children, and it doesn't end, by the way, when your children are grown. That continues. You're still their mom and dad. Keep, keep investing into them. But also our spiritual children and offspring, those that we disciple in the faith through the generations. This light of God is powerful. Isaiah 5.20 Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. My friends, this is happening before our very eyes. It's happening on a big level. It's happening on a grand scheme. And many are discouraged. Many of you are discouraged. And I've got good news. Don't be discouraged. The resurrection power of Jesus, it's there. If you want to put logs on the fire, if you want the fires of revival to flow in your life, repent from the darkness, repent from believing the darkness, and put a log on the fire. Some of you'd say I'm old, and some of you'd say I'm still young. But I've lived long enough now. I've watched people prosper in the light, and I've watched lives fall apart in the darkness. Because that's what the darkness does. It breaks people. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life. And so now I'm at a place in my life where I'm, I'm auditing the past decades and I'm trying to learn what I can from what's happened. And so I see people whose lives have literally just been consumed by the darkness and they thought they were doing the right thing. And I've seen people whose lives have been blessed with generational blessing. That's another whole teaching because every generation of blessing multiplies. A lot of people, they'll... They'll do it the first generation, and then the blessings come, the fruit comes from that. How many times have you met people who, you know, they're tithing, and then they get that raise on their job, or they get a new job, and then they're tithing, and then they get another raise, and they're like, man, I'm making too much money. I can't tithe anymore. What happens? You know what happens. Now, I know I'm meddling with tithing on resurrection morning when people visit church and all that, but the point is that everything in life, there is a harvest that comes in generations. What you sow in your 20s, you will reap in your 30s. What you sow in your 30s, you will reap in your 40s. What you sow in your 40s, you'll reap in your 50s. And so now I'm in my 50s. I'm in my mid-50s. And I'm watching people who are reaping generations of darkness, decades of darkness, and the, and the level of seduction and deception is much greater. They sat right here in these pews, not in this church, but in another building. They sat in the pew or the seats of, of this very church, New Covenant Fellowship, many of them. And their lives have been consumed by darkness. Others, their lives, they've had generational light upon light, and every generation is multiplied a hundred times. And, and, and then all of a sudden you look and you go, wow. And the contrast is scary. So those of you who are in your teens and 20s, 
and thirties. I'm just talking to you right now. I mean, go for God with everything you got. Repent. Don't let that darkness in. Listen, if you even let 3% of darkness in your life, the enemy will graze on 3% of compromise. He will graze. You give the devil an inch, he'll take a mile, and then he'll take 10 miles. This is serious. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So here we are. In, in, in Egypt, God drew a contrast between good and evil so that he could show, even before Jesus was resurrected, that the resurrection power of God was operating in Israel even during the plagues. There are plagues upon our land right now, and there are more coming. How do we proceed? How do we live? The good news is that God is with us. I'm going to ask Beth if you would to come up, hon. She's going to share with you a little bit about the plagues. But I want to just say this, that some of the plagues hit everybody. And some of the plagues were only allowed to hit those who lived in darkness. And this is important because now we have entered into a season not just in our nation, in some of the nations of the world, a lot of the nations of the world, where there are, I'm going to call them plagues. I don't know what else to call them. But they are harvests that are coming for evil decisions that have been made. And so now we're living in some of that. And the good news is that we are living in resurrection power. Don't be afraid of the plagues. This is the word of the Lord. Do not be afraid of the plagues, but don't put your head in the sand and do nothing, right? So this resurrection power is here for us, and she's going to share with us some thoughts on the plagues that I believe are going to be a good transfer application for where we are today, and then we'll, we'll visit that a little bit before we run out of time. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I do want to address one thing that Rod said um, he said that he walks in a spirit of victory, and that's very, very true. Our family walks in victory, but what does that mean? It means we've had battles. We cannot walk in victory if there's no battles. And so often, I think of my own life, and when I would hear really good preaching, about walking in victory and being a victorious overcomer. Do you know what I thought? I'll give my life to Jesus, and I will never have to work at this again. I won't have to face all of that. I'll be an overcomer. Well, you can't be an overcomer without something to overcome. I'll be like, I'll be victorious. And then these battles would come. And those battles cause our faith to be shaken if our thought about being victorious and walking in the light doesn't include the whole picture. If all we see is the victory and the light and we don't acknowledge that there is a battle, that there is darkness, we get angry when the battle comes before us. We get angry at God for not keeping it from coming to us. We might get angry at our parents for raising us in this word of victory in life. We might get angry at ourselves for falling and failing. But the reality is God has given us victory. He is with us in the midst of the battle, just like he gave the Israelites that resurrection power. But let me tell you, when Moses got the promise from God at the burning bush, he came back to Israel. He was scared. He was shaken in his boots. He didn't want to go. And so God said, I'll send your brother with you. Now go. And when they went before Pharaoh, Pharaoh said, sure, sounds like a good idea to me. Go on out to the wilderness. No. The reality is life got worse for the Israelites when Moses and Aaron went before them. And then God, and Moses cried out to God. He was like, God, why did you send me? I went, I stood before Pharaoh, I did the scary thing, and now everything is worse. 
Do you ever feel like that? God, you gave me a promise. I prayed. I tithed. I did all the things, and now everything is worse. In God's answer back to Moses, he reiterates the four promises, and we're in the season of celebrating Passover, and many families celebrate the Passover, and these are the four promises that God reiterated. Number one, I will bring you out. Two, I will rescue you. Three, I will redeem you. And four, I will take you as my people. I will be your God. That's marriage language, you guys. That's marriage covenant language. And he reiterated the promises. Don't lose heart. Those promises are still true. God's word is true. And if there's anything that we have learned through our lives, you can trust God. Even when it's hard, even when it's dark, you can trust God. He is with you in the midst. So the plagues. First one, all of the waters of the river, the streams, the ponds, all of the river water that was held in basins, everything turned to blood everywhere. That means Egyptians and Israelites. Everyone saw this water turn to blood. Everyone got thirsty. And the desert is a scary place to be thirsty in. Second one, frogs covered the land of Egypt. The frogs died and it stunk. Everyone had frogs in their beds. Everyone had frogs in their ovens. Everyone had frogs in their kneading bowls. The frogs were everywhere. And then when they gathered them together and they all died, it stunk everywhere. Everyone experienced it. Third, there was lice throughout the entire land of Egypt. Everyone experienced it. Can you imagine how the Israelites must have felt? Plague after plague after plague, after Pharaoh has already made their lives more and more difficult, they had to hold on to the promise of God, I will bring you out. So the fourth one, we get a new development with the swarms of flies that came. In Exodus chapter 8, verse 22, it says, In that day, this is God speaking, In that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen, in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there. Whoa. First time we get a geographical line separating from the rest of Egypt and the land of Goshen where the, the Israelites live. I will, I will set apart the land of Goshen in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there in order that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the land. I will make a difference between my people and your people. So then the fifth plague comes, and the livestock is diseased. And what you need to know is that the land of Goshen was like the best pasture land, the best place to grow things. They were in that that Nile Delta that's very lush and green and wonderful. They had the best of the land. The Israelites lived in the best of the land. Also, they were willing to shepherd all the livestock, the cattle, all the sheep, all of that, and that was uh, deemed a really low job to the Egyptians. So many of the richer Egyptians would take all of their livestock, put it out into that land of Goshen, and have the Israelites watching over it. So we get the, the fifth plague of the livestock being diseased. You've got an Egyptian-owned cow standing in a field with an Israelite-owned cow, And the plague comes upon them, and it's the Egyptian cow that gets diseased right side by side in the field. But all of the livestock of the Israelites was left untouched. A very strong dividing line. Very clear. God's people and the Egyptians. That line was drawn strong. The light of God was amidst the people of God. Then plague six comes. It's an outbreak of boils. There's no distinction that we see in scripture. Everyone suffered the plague of boils. But in the seventh plague, there was fiery hail. 
and there are two conditions that were given for those who could escape the plague of fiery hail. The first condition was anyone who listened to the word and the warning of God, that this is one of the first times he gives a warning. He said, anyone, take your livestock, get them undercover, and everyone get inside because I'm going to rain down hail upon the land like you have never seen before. And great hail came down with fire. And anyone who listened, anyone, Egyptian or Israelite, anyone who listened and got people undercover, they were saved. And... It says in the scripture, uh, Exodus 9, verse 26, only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, there was no hail. Praise God. The eighth one is locusts covered all the land of Egypt, but the Israelites could not lose heart. God is true to his promise. The ninth one Rod mentioned the plague of darkness. It lasted for three days. It was such a thick darkness. It could not have been just a physical darkness. You could not see your hand in front of your face. And the word of God said that the people could not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. They didn't even get out of bed. It was so dark. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. You couldn't light a candle in the rest of Egypt. No light would shine. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. And the tenth plague, which is perhaps the most famous plague of all, the death of the firstborn, the distinguishing line this time is not geographic between the land of Egypt and Goshen. And it's not even by bloodline or family relationship, whether you're an Egyptian or whether you're an Israelite. This plague will only pass over those homes who have obeyed the Lord to slay the lamb, to put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost and the lintel, and everyone be inside when the angel of death passes over. The distinguishing line is obedience to come under the blood of the lamb. It's the same for us. To be in obedience, to come under the blood of the Lamb, to receive that blood that speaks a better word over our lives. But it's more than just praying a prayer and saying the right words. It's walking in obedience and living and abiding in that light that he gives day after day after day. It's walking in repentance. It's getting up again when we fall and fail, repenting and going toward the Lord again and abiding in that light that he gives us. We cannot lose heart when we see the darkness growing all around us. We cannot lose heart when we see those tears prospering all around us because the light is living within us. We walk in obedience to what the Lord has told us to not fear and to let our light shine into the darkness that others may come and see the greatness of our God. This is all real now. This is where we are. If... If you and I, I mean, if you don't know this is where we are, I pray that God will help you. Seriously, I don't mean this in a condescending way, to open our eyes to see where we are. Now, I, when I was young, I knew this stuff is supernatural, but I didn't understand that it was supernatural. I have seen the hand of the Lord. God is faithful. And I want to ask if our musicians just come up. I, I want to, um, come on up, yeah. I want to uh, invite each of us, not so much, I mean, you could come to the altar and pray or just pray with your family, but I'll tell you, I, I pray God will put a, a fire in my bones and that will not let that darkness have place in my life, in my family, or in my mind. 
This spirit of victory that we're talking about is so important. We visited some friends years ago, and they were telling me that their son was a football player. He played high school football. And they said, yeah, he's been on the team for two years, and they've never won a game. And the Spirit of God rose up in me right then. I was like, I mean, literally, the Spirit of the Lord came upon me. And I said, what? They've never won a game. I said, we got to pray right now. And they looked at me like I was unspiritual. And they're like, what are you talking about? I said, they need to win. Here's the reason why. I said, you cannot have your son growing up and start believing he's a loser. You got to train him to be a winner. I'm not saying they're always going to be state champions, but I'm saying that there needs to be a spirit of victory. This is not about the game. It's not about the league. It's about his heart. And I said, let's pray. And we prayed right then. I said, in the name of Jesus, and we prayed. They won their next game. And then they won their next game. That young man, I don't have time to tell you his story, but if I told you, you would be shocked. Because there was a tenacity of spirit that came up that was spiritual. I, I want to pray for us. Let's stand up. And, and that really, there is an altar call, and that is to your family this morning. Your own family. Are you going to build a fire in your house? Are you going to say, we're going to live in the light? And when we find out if we're in the darkness in this area, or we're believing or embracing the darkness in this area, no more. We're going to say no to the darkness. If we're wrong, we're going to eat some humble pie and we're going to repent and say, God, please forgive me. I was wrong about this. This is not right. And so the, the call this morning, and I'm, I'm going to answer my own altar call. When I get done, I'm going to go down. I'm going to pray with my wife and my kids. I'm not telling you that so you'll respect me. I'm just saying I, this is how important I believe it is. And let's pray as families for just a few minutes and say we're going to commit our family to live in the light. Guys, listen, there's more plagues coming, but we got the blood. If you want it, we have the blood of Jesus. And we're going to put the blood of Jesus over our doorposts. And when the plagues come over, when the angel of death, whatever it is that comes over, we're believing God to prosper in the midst of the darkness and to carry this resurrection power. This is not just about when you die. This is about now. This is about today. This is about tomorrow. This is about this generation of young people we just saw here. Right now, you have the power to make a difference on where they end up. Those kids that are in kids' church, right now, we have the power. Those of you that are standing in this room, you're young couples and you're you know, in your 20s or 30s, we have the power. This is why we're saying it right now. We have the power to make a difference for you. Please understand, this is real. And it's going to determine whether you are touched by God to move into the light. Christians, I'm talking to you too, right? Not just unbelievers. By the way, if you're not a believer, or if you're not sure, right now, just give your life to the Lord. Just say, God, have mercy on me. I give my life to you, everything. You can do it right there, right now. And let's believe God together because this is real and it's going to have real fruit. Amen? Let's, let's do it together right now.